is being recorded. There it goes. All right, I'm going to present my screen. Um, you have a new assignment on Google Classroom uh, for ELA. It's called My Life with the Chimpanzees. Have any of you guys heard of Jane Goodall before? No. A couple, couple of you guys, what about online? Have any of you guys heard of Jane Goodall? I mean, she doesn't talk to chimpanzees. Uh, she might. I don't know a ton about her. I think this will be a learning one for me, too. I don't know a ton about her either. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get that assignment open, My Life with Chimpanzees, with the chimpanzees. Uh, if you uh, are unaware, a chimpanzee is a type of monkey. Mm -hmm. They are big and hairy. Yeah. Okay. Technically, they're a great ape. A great ape. All right. Yeah. Monkeys have toes. Oh. Really? I didn't know that. No. Okay. Some monkeys do. Not all monkeys. But monkeys don't have toes. That's fine. Does he not? All right, I'll give you about one minute to get this pulled up. <coughs> Thank you. Yep. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and get this pulled up, please. When you're there online, just give me like a thumbs up or a uh, I'm there or something in the text or the chat works for me too. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I don't know why it has so much hair. Why do you have so much hair? I don't know. Keep them warm, maybe. All righty. Oh, my daughter broke the leg while hairy in the winter. Keep them warm. It's definitely how it goes. All righty. So let's go ahead and get going on this. Um, this is part of a book. It's not like the whole story of what how she works with these animals. So we're going to um, listen to the background and learn about the author. We're going to do only two sections today because um, we're going to kind of expand this to a longer one. Um, most likely we're going to watch a movie kind of like documentary type thing at the end of this that goes is kind of the same type of information but it's more of a like actual representation of Jane Goodall. I think it's a documentary about her, um, but it's on Disney Plus. So we'll probably watch that later, but not for like a week or so. So let's real quick, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna play this out loud, so it might be loud if you're online. We're gonna do the background and the author really quick, and then we're gonna go over and do the concept of vocab. So the background first, here we go. It might be loud, so one, two, three. From My Life with the Chimpanzees by Jane Goodall. Memoir. Background. Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania, Africa, is best known as the site of Jane Goodall's groundbreaking chimpanzee research. The park covers only about 20 square miles, but is home to a great variety of animals. Dr. Goodall's research in Gombe was supported by the famous paleontologist, Louis Leakey. In this account, Dr. Goodall occasionally refers to Dr. Leakey by his first name only. About the author, Dame Jane Goodall, born 1934, is the most celebrated primatologist or researcher of primates, which includes apes, chimpanzees, and monkeys, of the 20th century. She spent extended periods living with and observing chimpanzees in the wild, Dr. Goodall did most of her research in Tanzania at the Gombe Stream Game Reserve, now a national park, where she lived from 1960 to 1975. In 1977, she co-founded the Jane Goodall Institute for Wildlife Research, Education, and Conservation. All right. So it's a little bit about the author. So the, the author of this is the person that it's about. So it's a, sort of like an autobiography, but it's a memoir because she's going to be talking about her memories in this. Um, where is this story taking place? Where, does, where did that say it was coming from? Um, what country? 
How about that? If, yeah, if you need to look, open up the background part again, it's in the background part. Africa, it's in Tanzania, um, which is in Africa. Uh, I don't know if it's north or south or east or west. I don't know. I don't know. It's on that map up there. Well, Yoshi, the bottom map is a map of the United States. The top one is a map of the world. So we're going to go ahead and go with the world. So it's like right in the middle. All right. So Tanzania is like right in the middle of Africa, it looks like. Kind of on the side a little bit. All right. Cool. So she's in Africa. She lived there for a long time. She said they said that she lived there from like 1960 to 1975. She is still alive. Um, it said that she was born in 1934. So she's like 86 years old or something like that around there. Um, so yeah, we're going to go over to the right over here under making meaning and start with the concept vocab. We're only doing two sections today. We're going to do the concept vocabulary. We're going to read the story and we're going to do the first read and then we'll be done for the day. But let's go ahead and review some uh, vocabulary words that you're probably going to see in the story. It says, you will encounter the following words as you read this excerpt from My Life with the Chimpanzees. Before reading, note how familiar you are with each of the words. Then rank the words in order from most familiar to least familiar. So go ahead and open up this uh, chart right here on the right. <clears throat> yep, under concept vocabulary, we're opening that chart. So we have six words here. Um, you don't need to look up the definition or anything just yet. You are going to put a ranking of one through six of how familiar you are with the words. So, so how much you know them, yeah. So if you've heard the word vanished before, you're like, okay, yeah, I kind of know what vanished is. Maybe that's the one that's your number one. You're most familiar with that word. Maybe miserable is like a two or a three. Um, the one that I think might be like a six for you guys is the impetus. That one's a bit of one that you probably haven't seen very often. So maybe that's your number six. It's the one you're least familiar with. So go ahead and rank these from that. So if you don't know what it means, then maybe make it your six. I'm not going to tell you yet. We'll go over them. No, it can be like your five. No, six is your least. So one is like you're most familiar with it. A six is the one that you least know about. Yep. Okay, well, you got to rank it from one through six. So, huh? Threateningly? Yeah. So the words are vanish, miserable, irritable, threateningly, impetus, and dominant. So rank those a one through six. I will do it as well. Huh? I mean, we'll do that after we read the story, yeah. Okay, so I have my ranking of a one through six. I do know what all of these words are, but some of them I use more often than others, so I kind of put them in order of that for me. Okay, one through six. I'll give you guys about one more minute on this part. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, so go ahead and be filling out that chart under concept vocab. We'll go about one more minute. Thank you. 
that but it will be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. All righty. We good on this? Ready for the next little section of concept vocab? All right. How are we doing online? Still good? Okay. Good. All righty. So I'm going to close this chart. If you need to go back and rank your words later, totally fine. If we scroll down, oh, you don't even have to talk about what the words are. So as we're reading it, then we'll stop at those words and do the definition and talk about them in the context of the story as we read. So we're gonna do the first read, which is, we're gonna read it. It's gonna read it to you. It's kind of a long one. It's probably about 25 minutes long. It's gonna take a while to read. Um, it's about the same length as Peter Pan. So it's gonna take a while to read, but that's why we're spending multiple days on this, like a week or so, because it's gonna take a while to analyze everything in here. If you close the concept vocab at the beginning, and look at the first read. It is very similar to what we have done every single time we've read a story, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. There are the four sections again. You have notice, annotate, what are the other two? Connect and respond. So maybe as we're reading, if you want to highlight things that might seem important as we read, that's totally fine. Um, if you want to type out some things as we read because you connect to some of the ideas from it. Totally fine, but we are going to complete this chart after, so you can wait until after. Are we ready to read the story? It's kind of a long one. So we'll stop every once in a while, do a little bit of a comprehension check to make sure that you guys are following along and understanding what's happening. All right, are we ready? Okay, I'm going to start it. If it's too loud for you guys online, just be prepared. Ready? All right, I'm going to start it in one, two, Three. From My Life with the Chimpanzees by Jane Goodall. July 16th, 1960 was a day I shall remember all my life. It was when I first set foot on the shingle and sand beach of Chimpanzee Land, that is, Gombe National Park. I was 26 years old. Mom and I were greeted by the two African Game Scouts who were responsible for protecting the 30 square miles of the park. They helped us to find a place where we could put up our old ex-army tent. We chose a lovely spot under some shady trees near the small, fast-flowing Kakombe stream. In Kagoma, before setting out, we had found a cook, Dominic. He put up his little tent some distance from ours and quite near the lake. When camp was ready, I set off to explore. It was already late afternoon, so I could not go far. There had been a grass fire not long before though all the vegetation of the more open ridges and peaks had burned away. This made it quite easy to move around, except that the slopes above the valley were very steep in places, and I slipped several times on the loose, gravelly soil. Okay, real quick, before we get too far, where are they? Um, Gombe National Park, good. It's where the chimpanzees are. Where is that? Where do we talk about where it is? Africa. In Africa. It was kind of like the middle eastern part of it, right? Kind of where it was? I couldn't see as far, that far. But that's where I assumed it. you guys were. It's on the eastern coast of Africa. Cool. So they're in Africa. They're setting up camp. What do you guys think they're going to do here? Study chimpanzees. Study chimpanzees. I think you're probably right. So we are on paragraph five. Oh, too far. Hold up. Sorry. Paragraph five. Here we go. I shall never forget the thrill of that first exploration. Soon after leaving camp, I met a troop of baboons. They were afraid of the strange, white-skinned creature, that was I, and gave their barking alarm call, Wahoo! Wahoo! again and again. I left them, hoping that they would become used to me soon. Otherwise, I thought, all the creatures of Gombe would be frightened. As I crossed a narrow ravine, crowded with low trees and bushes, I got very close to a beautiful red gold bush buck, a forest antelope, about the size of a long-legged goat. I knew it was female because she had no horns. When she scented me, she kept quite still for a moment and stared toward me with her big, dark eyes. Then, with a loud barking call, she turned and bounded away. 
When I got to one of the high ridges, I looked down into the valley. There, the forest was dark and thick. That was where I planned to go the next day to look for chimpanzees. When I got back to camp, it was dusk. Dominic had made a fire and was cooking our supper. That evening, and for the next four days, we had fresh food from Kigoma. But after that, we ate out of cans. Lewis had not managed to find very much money for our expedition, so our possessions were few and simple. A knife, fork, and spoon each, a couple of tin plates and tin mugs. But that was all we needed. After supper, Mom and I talked around our campfire, then snuggled into our two cots in the tent. Early the next morning, I set out to search for chimpanzees. I had been told by the British game ranger in charge of Gombe not to travel about the mountains by myself, except near camp. Otherwise, I had to take one of the game scouts with me. So I set off with Adolf. That first day, we saw two chimps feeding in a tall tree. As soon as they saw us, they leapt down and vanished. The next day, we saw no chimps at all, nor the day after, nor the day after that. All right, so there's our first vocabulary word, vanish. Without even clicking on it to see what it means, we use the context clues around it. As soon as they saw us, they leapt down and vanished. The next day, we saw no chimps. What does it mean to vanish? Hang on, raise it. Yeah. Disappear? Disappear, yeah. They leave. They're gone. So if you actually click on it, what does it say? Disappeared. Good. So they just, they're gone. They vanished. They disappeared. Do they see them for a couple days after that? Nope. Why do you think they're gone? Some of the animals were calling to each other as well earlier. Why are they doing that? Because they're scared. To warn them about the humans? Good. And to warn them. They're scared that there's humans around and they're warning the other animals in the park, like, hey, there's some humans around. This could not go well. I'm sure that they don't have very good experiences with humans. Most animals are scared of us. So, because, you know, some of us hunt them. Mr. Turner. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but I was talking about hunting. I'm sorry, I was distracted. Did you guys stop me on the Curious George thing? The Curious George has no tell suggesting that he is actually an ape or possibly a Barbary macaque. Do you even know they call him a monkey? Curious George is, is an ape, a type of ape because it has no tail. Interesting. <laughs> I was talking about hunting. I was. Okay. Talking about how some animals are scared of humans because they hunt them. But that's my uh, vegetarian views. So, all right. Um, paragraph number nine. So they haven't seen chimpanzees for a few days, and here we go. A whole week went by before we found a very big tree full of tiny round red fruits that Adolf told me were called Msalula. From the other side of the valley, we could watch chimps arriving at the tree, feeding, then climbing down and vanishing into the forest. I decided to camp in the best viewing site so that I could see them first thing in the morning. I spent three days in that valley and I saw a lot of chimps, but they were too far away and the foliage of the tree was too thick. It was disappointing and frustrating, and I didn't have much to tell Mum when I got back. There was another problem that I had to cope with. Adolf was very lazy. He was almost always late in the morning. I decided to try another man, Rashidi. He was far better and helped me a lot, showing me the trails through the forest and the best ways to move from one valley to the next. He had sharp eyes and spotted chimps from far away. But even after several months, the chimps had not become used to us. They ran off if we got anywhere near to them. I begged the game ranger to let me move about the forest by myself. I promised that I would always... Hello.
Get into like a, a, a connection. Yeah. You guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that might happen. Um, I it's pretty stormy outside. I think. Well, it's not very stormy, but I know the internet. There's a lot of trouble going on with the internet right now, so that might happen again. Um, I had to reload Savis, so it might take me a minute to figure out where we were, and get back to the spot we were at. So give me a minute. Um, we're on 12. We're on 12? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, From my location, I got up when I heard the alarm. Oh, I think that was exactly where we were. Wow. I'm just that good, guys. Don't worry. Okay. So, um, let's just review a little bit for a second. Um, so Jane Goodall is in Africa and Tanzania with her mom, and she had a like a guide that would take her around the the park named Adolf. He was lazy. She didn't like him very much. So she replaced him with Rashidi. And he, Rashidi, helps her find the chimps and all that stuff. And finally agrees to let her um, go off by herself. And that's where we're at. Are you ready? I'm going to get going. And here we go. Clock at 5.30 AM. I ate a couple of slices of bread and had a cup of coffee from the thermos flask. Then I set off, climbing to where I thought the chimps might be. Most often, I went to the peak. Huh? Oh, I'm not presenting. My bad. Thanks, guys. OK, let's try this again. Now we're, now we're good, getting there. OK, here we go. We're on paragraph 13. I discovered that from this high place, I had a splendid view in all directions. I could see chimps moving in the trees, and I could hear if they called. At first, I watched from afar, through my binoculars, and never tried to get close. I knew that if I did, the chimps would run silently away. Gradually, I began to learn about the chimps' home and how they lived. I discovered that, most of the time, the chimps wandered about in small groups of six or less, not in a big troop like the baboons. Often a little group was made up of a mother with her children, or two or three adult males by themselves. Sometimes many groups joined together, especially when there was delicious ripe fruit on one big tree. When the chimps got together like that, they were very excited, made a lot of noise, and were easy to find. Eventually, I realized that the chimps I watched from the peak were all part of one group, a community. There were about 50 chimps belonging to this community. They made use of three of the valleys to the north of the Kakombe Valley, where our tent was, and two valleys to the south. These valleys have lovely sounding names. Kasakela, Linda, and Rutonga in the north, Makinke, and Nyasanga in the south. From the peak, I noted which trees the chimps were feeding in, and then, when they had gone, I scrambled down and collected some of the leaves, flowers, or fruits so they could be identified later. I found that the chimps eat mostly fruits, but also a good many kinds of leaves, blossoms, seeds, and stems. Later, I would discover that they eat a variety of insects and sometimes hunt and kill prey animals to feed on meat. During those months of gradual discovery, the chimps very slowly began to realize that I was not so frightening after all. Even so, it was almost a year before I could approach to within 100 yards and that is not really very close. The baboons got used to me much more quickly. Indeed, they became a nuisance around our camp by grabbing any food that we accidentally left lying on the table. I began to learn more about the other creatures that shared the forests with the chimpanzees. There were four kinds of monkeys in addition to the baboons, and many smaller animals, such as squirrels and mongooses. There was also a whole variety of nocturnal nighttime creatures, porcupines and civets, creatures looking rather like raccoons, and all manners of rats and mice. Only a very few animals in the forest at Gombe were potentially dangerous, mainly buffalo and leopards. 
Bush pigs can be dangerous too, but only if you threaten them or they're young. And of course, there are poisonous snakes, seven different kinds. Once, as I arrived on the peak in the early morning before it was properly light, I saw the dark shape of a large animal looming in front of me. I stood quite still. My heart began to beat fast, for I realized it was a buffalo. Many hunters fear buffalo more than lions or elephants. By a lucky chance, the wind was blowing from him to me, so he couldn't smell me. He was peacefully gazing in the opposite direction and chewing his cud. He hadn't heard my approach. Always, I try to move as quietly as I can in the bush. So, though I was only ten yards from him, he had no idea I was there. Very slowly, I retreated. All right, so she's out in this wilderness. How long have they been there? How long have they been studying these animals? A year. At least a year, right? Has she gotten close enough to like really see a chimpanzee up close yet? Yeah. Just a hundred yards. A hundred yards away. That's a whole football field away. That's pretty far away to be able to see up close to a chimpanzee. She usually has to follow along behind them after they leave an area to see what they were eating or what they were doing and stuff like that. So. She hasn't been that close to them yet, which is very difficult to study an animal without being that close. So you can imagine that she's probably going to be there for a while, right? Trying to get close enough to see them and study them more. So we are on paragraph 21. Here we go. Another time, as I was sitting on the peak, I heard a strange mewing sound. I looked around and there, about 15 yards away, a leopard was approaching. I could just see the black and white tip of its tail above the tall grass. It was walking along the little trail that led directly to where I sat. Leopards are not usually dangerous unless they have been wounded. But I was frightened of them in those days, probably as a result of my experience with the leopard and the wolfhound two years before. And so, very silently, I moved away and looked for chimps in another valley. Later, I went back to the peak. I found that... Just like any cat, that leopard had been very curious. There, in the exact place where I had been sitting, he had left his mark, his droppings. Most of the time, though, nothing more alarming than insects disturbed my vigils on the peak. It began to feel like home. I carried a little tin trunk up there. In it, I kept a kettle, some sugar and coffee, and a tin mug. Then, when I got tired from a long trek to another valley... I could make a drink in the middle of the day. I kept a blanket up there, too, and when the chimps slept near the peak, I slept there so that I could be close by in the morning. I loved to be up there at night, especially when there was a moon. If I heard the coughing grunt of a leopard, I just prayed and pulled the blanket over my head. Okay, so she's up on this peak, which um, is like a hill, right? That's what, I, that's what I've gathered. Like, it's kind of up near the top of the place right um and she just kind of sits there and watches all day would you guys want to do that no no not at all you might fall asleep yeah it would be difficult to just sit there right and not do anything and just watch these animals and not even be able to interact with them every once in a while say that again Better than going to school. Maybe. She did go to school, though. She's 26 in the story, so she did already do all the schooling stuff. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's, I, I would find it a little bit boring, I think. I don't know if other people would, but. I think I would get bored doing it for a day. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. It depends on how much interest you have in it. So, like, I don't have a lot of interest in going and sitting on top of a hill and watching animals. I have an interest so, with animals. Yeah. But she, like, loves chimpanzees and things like that and wants mm -hmm. to learn about them. So she is very interested in this and is willing to do it. So somebody's got to be, right? All right. So we are on paragraph 25. Here we go. Chimps sleep all night, just as we do. From the peak, I often watched how they made their nests or beds. 
first the chimp bent a branch down over some solid foundation, such as a fork or two parallel branches. Holding it in place with his feet, he then bent another over it. Then he folded the end of the first branch back over the second, and so on. He often ended up by picking lots of small, soft, leafy twigs to make a pillow. Chimps like their comfort. I've learned over the years that infants sleep in their nest with their mothers until they are about five years old, or until the next baby is born and the older child has to make its own bed. I never returned to camp before sunset, but even when I slept on the peak, I first went down to have supper with Mum and tell her what I had seen that day, and she would tell me what she had been doing. Mum set up a clinic. She handed out medicine to any of the local Africans mostly fishermen who were sick. Once, she cured an old man who was very ill indeed. Word about this cure spread far and wide, and sometimes patients would walk for miles to get treatment from the wonderful white woman doctor. Her clinic was very good for me. It meant that the local people realized we wanted to help. When Mum had to go back to England after four months to manage things at home, the Africans wanted, in turn, to help me. Of course, Mum worried about leaving me on my own. Dominic was a wonderful cook and great company. He was not really reliable. So Louis Leakey asked Hassan to come all the way from Lake Victoria to help with the boat and engine. It was lovely to see his handsome, smiling face again, and his arrival relieved Mum's mind no end. Of course, I missed her after she'd gone, but I didn't have time to be lonely. There was so much to do. Soon after she'd left, I got back one evening and was greeted by an excited Dominic. He told me that a big male chimp had spent an hour feeding on the fruit of one of the oil nut palms growing in the camp clearing. Afterward, he had climbed down, gone over to my tent, and taken the bananas that had just been put there for my supper. This was fantastic news. For months, the chimps had been running off when they saw me. Now one had actually visited my camp. Perhaps he would come again. The next day, I waited in case he did. What a luxury to lie in until 7 a.m. As the hours went by, I began to fear that the chimp wouldn't come. But finally, at about four in the afternoon, I heard a rustling in the undergrowth opposite my tent, and a black shape appeared on the other side of the clearing. I recognized him at once. It was the handsome male with the dense white beard. I had already named him David Graybeard. Quite calmly, he climbed into the palm and feasted on its nuts, and then he helped himself to the bananas I had set out for him. There were ripe palm nuts on that tree for another five days, and David Graybeard visited three more times and got lots of bananas. A month later, when another palm tree in camp bore ripe fruit, David again visited us, and on one of those occasions, he actually took a banana from my hand. I could hardly believe it. All right, so it's her mom left, right? And she's been chilling and still doing her job. And now instead of having to go out to the chimpanzees, she's got one that's visiting her somewhat, kind of. It's coming for the food for sure. But she's getting getting to see it more up close and all of that stuff. You think it would be scary? You think she's scared of them? Um, she's probably used to those ones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's probably not scared of them, but I can guarantee you that, at least for me, if a chimpanzee started walking up to me, I'd be like, I'm out. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. It said that they sometimes eat meat. But just because they're a vegetarian doesn't mean they won't hurt me. Yeah, they're very, very strong Yeah, so chimps can be very dangerous. I would not be um, very comfortable around one. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. We are on paragraph 37. Here we go. From that time on, things got easier for me. Sometimes when I met David Graybeard out in the forest, he would come up to see if I had a banana hidden in my pocket. The other chimps stared with amazement. 
Obviously, I wasn't as dangerous as they had thought. Gradually, they allowed me closer and closer. It was David Greybeard who provided me with my most exciting observation. One morning, near the peak, I came upon him squatting on a termite mound. As I watched, he picked a blade of grass, poked it into a tunnel in the mound, and then withdrew it. The grass was covered with termites, all clinging on with their jaws. He picked them off with his lips and scrunched them up. Then he fished for more. When his piece of grass got bent, he dropped it, picked up a little twig, stripped the leaves off it, and used that. I was really thrilled. David had used objects as tools. He had also changed a twig into something more suitable for fishing termites. He had actually made a tool. Before this observation, scientists had thought that only humans could make tools. Later, I would learn that chimpanzees use more objects as tools than any creature except for us. This finding excited Louis Leakey more than any other. In October, the dry season ended, and it began to rain. Soon, the golden mountain slopes were covered with lush green grass. Flowers appeared, and the air smelled lovely. Most days, it rained just a little. Sometimes, there was a downpour. I loved being out in the forest in the rain. And I loved the cool evenings when I could lace the tent shut and make it cozy inside with a storm lantern. The only trouble was that everything got damp and grew mold. Scorpions and giant poisonous centipedes sometimes appeared in the tent, even a few times a snake. But I was lucky. I never got stung or bitten. The chimpanzees often seem miserable in the rain. They looked cold and they shivered. So there's our next vocabulary word. Chim the chimpanzees often looked miserable. What would it mean to be miserable? Sad, distressed, not very happy, right? So miserable means extremely unhappy or uncomfortable. So do they like the rain? No, not really. I don't know. Um, let's keep going. So since they were clever enough. For enough to use tools. I was surprised that they had not learned to make shelters. Many of them got coughs and colds. Often, during heavy rain, they seemed irritable and bad-tempered. There's our next one. Irritable. They seemed irritable and bad-tempered. Annoyed might be a good way to say irritable. Any other ideas? Angry. Angry, maybe. What else? Hangry. Maybe hangry, if they're hungry, too, yeah. Um, you guys are on the right track. Irritable means that they're very annoyed or angry. Um, it's pretty. You're pretty easily annoyed or angry too. Like at the drop of a hat, you might be like, "Uh, -uh I'm not. I'm not happy about this." Something like that. But you're pretty bad tempered. Um, so when it's raining a lot, they are pretty easily annoyed. They might get angry. Um, so I, that's the time where I would not get close to a chimpanzee. Not at all. They might. I don't know. Um, yes, Charlie. I'm sorry. Good, I'm glad you ate something. Okay, paragraph 42. Here we go. Once, as I walked through thick forest in a downpour, I suddenly saw a chimp hunched in front of me. Quickly, I stopped. Then I heard a sound from above. I looked up, and there was a big chimp there, too. When he saw me, he gave a loud, clear wailing, raw, a spine-chilling call that is used to threaten a dangerous animal. To my right, I saw a large black hand shaking a branch and bright eyes glaring threateningly through the foliage. Then came another savage raw from behind. Up above, the big male began to sway the vegetation. I was surrounded. I crouched down, trying to appear as non-threatening as possible. Okay, there's our next one. Threateningly. The bright eyes were glaring threateningly through the foliage. What does it mean to be threatening? Uh, to threaten or to like, for example, to be so scared and done something. Yeah. Like threaten is like pointing your sword at, sword at someone. So to, yeah, you're threatening someone, basically. It's frightening. Um, usually you're alarmed by it. So that's kind of how they are using that definition. Um, you're, they're, basically these chimps the big male one is glaring at her like you are not in a good spot right now so we'll see how this goes we are on 
Paragraph 43. Here we go. Suddenly a chimp charged straight toward me. His hair bristled with rage. At the last minute, he swerved and ran off. I stayed still. Two more chimps charged nearby. Then suddenly, I realized I was alone again. All the chimps had gone. Only then did I realize how frightened I had been. When I stood up, my legs were trembling. Male chimps, although they are only four feet tall when upright, are at least three times stronger than a grown man. And I weighed only about 90 pounds. I had become very thin with so much climbing in the mountains and only one meal a day. That incident took place soon after the chimps had lost their initial terror of me, but before they had learned to accept me calmly as part of their forest world. If David Greybeard had been among them, they probably would not have behaved like that, I thought. After my long days in the forest, I looked forward to supper. Dominic always had it ready for me when I got back in the evenings. Once a month, he went into Kagoma with us on. They came back with new supplies, including fresh vegetables and fruit and eggs. And they brought my mail. That was something I really looked forward to. After supper, I would get out the little notebook in which I had scribbled everything I had seen while watching the chimps during the day. I would settle down to write it all legibly into my journal. It was very important to do that every evening while it was all fresh in my mind. Even on days when I climbed back to sleep near the chimps, I always wrote up my journal first. Gradually, as the weeks went by, I began to recognize more and more chimpanzees as individuals. Some, like Goliath, William, and Old Flo, I got to know well, because David Greybeard sometimes brought them with him when he visited camp. I always had a supply of bananas ready in case the chimps arrived. Once you have been close to chimps for a while, they are as easy to tell apart as your classmates. Their faces look different, and they have different characters. David Greybeard, for example, was a calm chimp who liked to keep out of trouble. But he was also very determined to get his own way. If he arrived in camp and couldn't find any bananas, he would walk into my tent and search. Afterward, all was chaos. It looked as though some burglar had raided the place. Goliath had a much more excitable, impetuous temperament. William, with his long-shaped face, was shy and timid. All right, so our next word there is, um, she said it differently than I did. I say it is impetus, but it might be wrong. What do you guys think it might mean? There's not a lot of context clues there, so what are your ideas? It's impetuous. Oh, oh you're right. Good. Shut up. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, good. 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 Upright, thank you. What do you guys think it means? I meant without the thing, but all right. <laughs> kind of. Yep, so if you open up the uh, vocab thing, it says it's acting suddenly with little thought. So it's almost like impulsive, like he'll do things just without thinking about it too much. Which makes sense. So Goliath is much more excitable, and he does things without thinking too often. Um, so that chimp might be a little bit uh, more scary to walk up to, I would feel like, because you never know what, you can't predict his behavior, okay? We are on um, 49, okay, here we go. Old Flo was easy to identify. She had a bulbous nose and ragged ears. She came to camp with her infant daughter, whom I named Fifi and her juvenile son, Fegan. Sometimes adolescent Fabin came too. It was from Flo that I first learned that in the wild, female chimps have only one baby every five or six years. The older offspring, even after they have become independent, still spend a lot of time with their mothers, and all the different family members help one another. Flo also taught me that female chimps do not have just one mate. One day, she came to my camp with a pink swelling on her rump. This was a sign that she was ready for mating. She was followed by a long line of suitors. Many of them had never visited my camp before, and they were scared. But they were so attracted to Flo that they overcame their fear in order to keep close to her. She allowed them all to mate with her at different times. Soon after the chimps had begun to visit my camp, the National Geographic Society which was giving Lewis money for my research, 
sent a photographer to Gombe to make a film. Hugo van Lawick was a Dutch baron. He loved and respected animals just as I did, and he made a wonderful movie. One year later, in England, we got married. By then, I had left Gombe for a while to start my own studies at Cambridge University. I hated to leave, but I knew I would soon be back. I had promised Lewis that I would work hard and get my PhD degree. After I got the degree, Hugo and I went back to Gombe together. It was a very exciting time, as Flo had just had a baby, little Flint. That was the first wild chimpanzee infant that I ever saw close up, nearly four years after I had begun my research. Flo came very often to camp looking for bananas. Fifi, now six years old, and Fegan, five years older, were still always with her. Fifi loved her new baby brother. When he was four months old, she was allowed to play with and groom him. Sometimes Flo let her carry him when they moved through the forest. During that time, Fifi learned a lot about how to be a good mother. Flint learned to walk and climb when he was six months old, and he learned to ride on his mother's back during travel instead of always clinging on underneath. He gradually spent more time playing with his two older brothers. They were always very gentle with him. So were other youngsters of the community. They had to be, for if Flo thought any other chimps were too rough, she would charge over and threaten or even attack them. I watched how Flint gradually learned to use more and more of the different calls and gestures that chimpanzees use to communicate with each other. Some of these gestures are just like ours, holding hands, embracing, kissing, patting one another on the back. They mean about the same, too. And although they do not make up a language the way human words do, all the different calls do help the chimpanzees know what is happening, even if they are far away when they hear the sounds. Each call, there are at least 30, perhaps more, means something different. Flo was the top-ranked female of her community and could dominate all the others, but she could not boss any of the males. In chimpanzee society, males are the dominant sex. Among the males themselves, there is a social order, and one male at the top is the boss. The first top-ranking male I knew was Goliath. Then, in 1964, Mike took over. He did this by using his brain. He would gather up one or two empty kerosene cans from my camp and hit and kick them ahead of him as he charged toward a group of adult males. It was a spectacular performance and made a lot of noise. The other chimps fled. So Mike didn't need to fight to get to the top, which was just as well, as he was a very small chimp. He was top male for six years. The adult males spend a lot of time in each other's company. They often patrol the boundaries of their territory and may attack chimpanzees of different communities if they meet. These conflicts are very brutal and the victim may die. Only young females can move from one community to another without being hurt. In fact, the big males sometimes go out looking for such females and try to take them back into their own territory. As the months went by, I learned more and more. I recorded more and more details when I watched the chimpanzees. Instead of writing the information in notebooks, I started to use a little tape recorder. Then I could keep my eyes on the chimps all the time. By the end of each day, there was so much typing to be done that I found I couldn't do it all myself. I needed an assistant to help. Soon, with even more chimps coming to camp, I needed other people to help with the observations. There were always more fascinating things to watch and record, more people to help write everything down. What had started as a little camp for Mum and me ended up, six years later, as a research center where students could come and collect information for their degrees. I was the director. All righty. That's our story. The end part there was all about the different interactions that she has recorded and seen between different chimps or chimps with herself, all kinds of different things. Um, we don't have a ton of time. So over on the right under making meaning, the only thing we're doing for the rest of this time is this first read. So we have about five minutes. Um, you can go ahead and open up the chart, the same chart that we have done so many times before. 
Our title is My Life with the Chimpanzees. Okay. Yes. Basically, we're just going to fill out the chart like we have been before. We're going to start by noticing different things about the text. What was it about and who was involved? What it was about. Who it was about. Okay, so you can answer that question. The annotating one is the same thing that we have been doing. There's a lot of information on in this story. So if you want to start at the beginning and go back through again, that's totally fine. However you want to do this, but try to highlight two important details. So something that you thought might have been important to the story, whether it was about one of the chimpanzees she interacted with, um, something about her personal life or her research, highlight two important things. You just have to highlight it in the story. No, just highlight it in the story. And then I'm just going to scroll down for a second. The second part, the bottom boxes, are the connections. So how can you connect this to other stories that we've read? Um, connect this story. Other stories. Yourself. Can you somehow connect this back to your life um another person maybe it was all the first person um or maybe something in the media okay so how can you connect this story to something else anything else just one connection and then our respond here we're going to write a brief summary so let's say two to three sentences just tell me what this was about, just so I know that you were paying attention. Just tell me what the gist of the story was. What was it about? So those are your four boxes that I would like you to complete. Got about four minutes until nine o'clock. So if you are online and you finish up in those four minutes, you can head out.